All right. Welcome back to the Seek Strength YouTube. Today we're talking about the one of the most famous lifters, the most aesthetic lifter, Liu Zhaojun from China. He is a former 77 kilo weightlifter, now an 81 kilo weightlifter. And um, he has been performing at the top of his game, which was the top of everyone else's game for a very, very long time. Like he has, he's now 36, is it? And he's going for mm. his uh, third Olympics. So this will be potentially his third Olympic medal and very possibly his second Olympic gold medal if everything goes right for him. And uh, we're just going to discuss today a five different kind of aspects or five different points why we think Lou is still so freaking good because um, when I kind of started weightlifting right and when Fitz started weightlifting too, we would have there would have been this kind of um, this kind of sense of by the time you hit 13 weightlifting your career was over like that was it and uh, no one really kind of gave it any credence it was just, not no credence no one just gave it any thought it was just kind of like once you hit 30 that was kind of it and that's kind of what we've seen from a lot of lifters like but realistically what what kind of was happening was it wasn't some just absolute biological cliff that people ran off when as soon as they hit 30 that was it that was just you know your speed went your strength went your ligaments your joints just disappeared after 30 once you hit that you fell off the cliff and there was just no more progress to be made and you couldn't possibly maintain any form of um any form of progress after that you could maintain any kind of shape you just turned into a big pile of shit but from what we're seeing it's um it's not it's not that simple and uh we're just going to delve into a couple of the reasons why yeah lou is the way he is and still the best in his weight class in the world so reason number one um and probably one of the biggest reasons of all five reasons is the fact that motivation for lou seems to still be so high you know uh i think with a lot of athletes once they've gone through one or two or three olympic cycles the motivation starts to wane off a small bit um and i think usually for the older athlete the reason the motivation wanes off a lot of the time is because they're not as competitive anymore you know it's something that they're they've been competing at such a high level for a long time or they've been competing at a certain level for a long time and once they start to see drops in performance that the motivation often kind of peters out for Lou and in Lou's case when he's training with like the Chinese team everything is so competitive he's hyper motivated all the time like obviously China is an incredibly patriotic country he's a like Gareth, as you were saying like he's a, a household name in china um and when you look at him in documentaries like the lift the world documentary he is very much a, a superstar over there and i don't think he's quite ready yet to kind of hand over the reins of that 77 kilo spot to anyone else like he's incredibly competitive he's always driven to win you'll see him even going for world records when he might necessarily not need to go for world records like that is the sign of a, a true competitor and I think it's definitely one of the reasons he's still so high up in the world rankings uh, as a 36 year old yeah like the the number one reason all these other reasons we'll give after this are without any you know they have no basis unless for this reason and that he just wants to be the best he still wants to do this like like one of the main things we'll come to see is that a lot of those lifters who we're talking about who kind of of um years past when they got to 30 or so it was just kind of at the stage where they'd been lifting for nearly 20 years plus 20 years for some of them and you know they're at a stage where they'd been through some very rigorous training environments um some uncaring training environments where they may not have been treated the best they may not have been given opportunities to recover from injuries or you know we've heard Ilya alien talk about leaving his first coaches because they pushed him too hard Sisman Kalecki was the same. He had a world record at 18, 232 and a half kilo clean and jerk. Um, he talked about his coach not letting him take a break. Um, that was This was after about 10 years of training again, you know. Like very often we saw weightlifters just were at the end of their tether psychologically. They just didn't want to train anymore. Competing wasn't worth it. They were in countries where there might have been no money for, you know, motiv there might have been no motivation. There might have been no support, whatever. Financially, um, you know, culturally, these lifters would have been left by the wayside and physically they weren't able to do it anymore or sorry psych psychologically they weren't able to bring themselves to do it anymore like spend another four years in an olympic cycle or or you know plus or minus whatever that was you know whereas lou has the has the motivation for all the right reasons really absolutely yeah um i think the other thing is due to the fact that lou is in a country that's 
currently so highly ranked. Like if they got was it twenty nine medals at the IWF World Championships last year, like when you're in a country that is succeeding and achieving so much in the sport at the moment, it's not it's not easy to keep motivation, but it's obviously a lot like your path to success is so much clearer, you know. I think if you'd a a thirty six year old Irish weightlifter who had been to Masters Europeans five or six times, you know, and they're like starting to get on a bit now where they've been to European seniors a few times and they want to go to Masters now. I think that is a much different situation from somebody who's in a country where weightlifting is so highly prized, it's so highly rewarded, um, and it's obviously going to be easier to stay motivated to train then. Yeah, like he had tasted the top, you know, he had an Olympic gold medal, or has obviously still, but he achieved one, multiple world championships, new world records, you know, it's probably very hard not to want to repeat those feelings again. Yeah, I think the last thing we should probably talk about with motivation is, like a lot of the thing we things we've talked about so far have been like extrinsic motivation factors, like the the fame he gets, the probably monetary value he gets, the the medals, everything like that. Like when you anytime you've heard Lou speaking um about why he likes weightlifting and why he likes competing, like he genuinely seems to love the sport of weightlifting. Like he really likes weightlifting, he really likes going and winning at competitions. Like it doesn't just seem like he's the kind of there for a paycheck and that's it like he he genuinely seems to be very very much intrinsically motivated to succeed point number two point number two is genetics we cannot deny Liu Zhaojun has some phenomenal genetics he's a stallion a race phenomenal. horse he's just an absolute inf- you know phenomenally talented like the gifts that were given to him at birth are cannot be denied you know he could have all the motivation he wants but without the genetics to be what he was and still is 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 would have been would be impossible like he just mm. has you know his anatomy his muscle fiber makeup even his fat le- levels like he's just yeah. you know he just has his genetics and all those things that come with it are phenomenal and that has to be you know taken into account like obviously he had the talent to win you know but he also has the genetics for longevity as well like clearly yeah. you know if you look at intrinsic things like he's you know his tendons and ligaments and joints obviously are very resilient and there's for a lot of other reasons too but you know just their makeup obviously is resilient to the massive volumes of training weightlifting for so long at such a high level yeah i think when you look at things that will genetically predispose lou to being successful at weightlifting like his morphology whatever it the physiology just simply the length and the size of certain piece of his body makes it it makes him very very good for biomechanical uh like advantage in weightlifting so he has incredibly short femurs which is unbelievably uh beneficial and advantageous for any sort of squatting or pulling movements he has a longer torso than his kind of upper legs so A long torso isn't great for pulling, right? Because the length of that lever, uh, like there's more force basically at the end of the lever. But what it does allow him to do is it allows him to pull with a very kind of upright stance. So because his femurs are very short and he has that kind of classical Chinese technique, which would be a very, very upright torso, a very quadsy pull, um, his his body is incredibly well suited. So if you took the complete... uh, opposite end of the scale it would be somebody who would be very limmy so they'd have super long legs super long arms uh it's obviously going to be harder for them to get really heavy weights overhead i'd say he probably has one bad factor and it it seems to be that he has very very small hands um but yet we haven't seen him missing lifts because he can't grip the bar properly so it obviously doesn't affect him that badly look as well on the and we'll get to this point later as well right so there is um kind of uh it's a touchy subject right and um i suppose unfortunately we have been very honest in all our videos and podcasts all along so there's no point stopping now and you know we don't (laughs) want to treat people like fools so realistically lou right there is um part number five is a subject that's very obvious right but it's very likely that lou has some genetics as well that are related to the excretion of certain metabolites if you know what i mean yeah and we'll talk about that later yeah like utilization of certain um supplements is clearly in his favour. Yes. Uh, I, probably the last thing I'll talk about on genetics is, like, 
the classic thing is like you can't train fast twitch like you can train fast twitch to a certain extent but Liu obviously has an unbelievable fiber type makeup that makes him very very fast twitch so his type 2 fibers take up the vast proportion of like cross-sectional area within the muscle you're probably not going to see Liu running a great 10k time uh, but he's obviously very, very good at fast, explosive movements. I think, Gareth, you were saying he was a sprinter at some stage in his like youth or adolescence. It's hard to know. It's hard to know. There's so many stories about how he started weightlifting. That was yeah. a story years ago, but no one knows if that's true realistically. Yeah. And that, like, yeah, we'll get onto it with structures later on, but about talent ID and how Lou was probably picked to become a weightlifter, um, there's other interesting areas around that. So number three is training history um, and training history and the people he's training with. Lou has a bank of years training in an incredibly professional setup, training with very, very good coaches and doing multiple long term four year plans, five year plans, six, eight year plans where everything is taught out. Everything is block periodized uh, and he is like this kind of bank of physical literacy built up due to that yeah like we have for example if you take his absolute strength so his max back squat it was 305 and so you can see he mentions that in his interview with weightlifting house our, our boy seb now he from what we've seen of him he's he's been hovering around 270 for the last few years and that makes perfect sense if you look at it in terms of what he needs for the olympic lifts he's trying to do in competition so Trio, having done 305 in the past will make it so much easier for him to maintain like 270 now so it's a lot less effort because it's a smaller percentage of that max you know but he'll also just because he can't do 305 right now or he's not putting the effort in to do 305 doesn't mean he doesn't maintain a lot of the benefits of that 305 305 kilo squat in, in the, these last couple of years so there's no need for him to repeat that or push it beyond it like another five kilos for him would be a huge amount of effort yeah. A huge amount of training volume, you know, a massive amount of investment for no particular benefit, really, no, you know, no advantage. So he has years of like high force training behind him, and then he has something incredibly useful, which is like Fitz said, the physical literacy. But he has one of the most important things of the lifts is you cannot rush the learning process of the lifts, and you can't rush learning each section of the lift and like thinking through them. And now he has at least, um, you know, he's probably close to 25 years of practicing the snatch and the clean and jerk and that is so important that is just cannot go without saying that that is an unbelievable advantage to have because he he yeah. talks about when he's interviews he talks about how the bar feels like he knows as soon as he pulls it what's going to happen and that is just that is one of the most useful like it's just crazy how important that is for weightlifting like you cannot rush the process and to have that many years of the lifts behind you is is just an absolutely phenomenal advantage Mm. I think the metric you always hear weightlifters talk about is like, you know, when you have some of the 94s and they talk about the amount of time they snatched over 190 or the amount of times they've done a clean and jerk over a certain weight. Like if you think about how long Lou has been snatching over 170, he probably has 100 lifts between training and competition where he's snatched over 170 or he has a huge amount of lifts built up. Like, all of that experience, all of that bank of knowledge, the physical literacy involved in that. Like, even just for going to competitions, you're probably talking about somebody with more competition experience in weightlifting at the high end than almost anybody else in the world. Uh, and, like, that that can't be discounted, you know. If you're... Everybody's seen what happens at weightlifting competitions. Everybody's seen delaying attempts. Everybody's seen all these different things that can happen. A warm-up going wrong. Uh, something else going wrong in the warm-up room. Uh, like, all of these things and all of this experience adds up for Lou. Uh, and the net effect being Lou is being a very, very effective competition athlete. And for example, as well, if you take, you know, the competition lifts he's trying to do, these are all still below his current uh, or previous all time best. So like he says 180 to 10 is are his best lifts. And I would believe the snatch is definitely his best, but I would almost certainly be thinking that 210 kilo clean and jerk is not his best clean jerk. I would say it's probably closer to 220. Um, like we know the Chinese kind of play some kind of games the other time or keep things under wraps and for good reason, like for their competitors and a lot of weightlifters do that. But 
I would be very, very doubtful that the 210 kilo clean and jerk is his real max. So all the lifts he's doing in competition are all sub-maximal his best. So he's not trying to improve. So he's just trying to maintain his performance as much as possible. And maintaining your performance is so much less hassle and effort than it is to try and improve upon performance. So like maintaining 90% or 95% can be done for much longer with less effort than it would take just literally improve by two kilos on any of those maxes. Yeah, I think the last thing then with training in our training history is that Lou doesn't seem to have had any large catastrophic injuries. So to the best of my knowledge, I don't think he's had any bone breaks. Don't think he's had any like major joint uh, issues. I think he's had some flare ups in his lower back, which is something that like over the last years has kind of popped up. That could be due to the the relatively long uh, torso he has compared to his legs. But like being able to combat small injuries as they kind of pop up, being able to like, I undoubtedly Lou has had so many small little flare ups, so many small little injuries, and he just keeps on top of them. They keep working on them. Obviously, leads to him being an incredibly resilient athlete, like physically resilient, just to be to stay that injury free for that long. Point number four is that Lou Zhaojun has some of the best and the greatest support system in the world. He has a training facility, he has coaching knowledge. He has literally everything you could possibly want if someone wants to be the best weightlifter. He has, he couldn't have a better support system around him. He has, um, for example, if you take his home life, his wife and his children understand why he's doing what he's doing. He's away from them for a very long time. He has um, superb food. He has nutritionists, he has doctors, he has training coaches with the you an enormous bank of knowledge with some of the most active lifters of any country in the world they have all of this data they have um he's had the same coach for a very very long time so this coach has built up an unbelievable rep- repertoire with him he has you know physios who's probably had for years same physios they you can see they bring in like um other physios from other countries and strength conditioning coaches to do like their gpp phases or whatever you know they have literally money is no concern he has a wage, you know, a phenomenal wage. I would imagine he's incredibly well taken care of financially. Like, he literally has everything you could possibly need to be a good weightlifter if you want it to be. Yeah, absolutely. Like, the, that Chinese system is phenomenal. It's world-renowned for a reason. Like, I think the other thing that's involved with that system, and Gurf kind of touched on it, is the bank of lifters they have. Like, it's not like Liu is going and training on a training squad where maybe another one or two people are going to the Olympics. Uh, or like in certain countries, nobody else might be going to the Olympics. But Lou is going to large training camps where he's training with like up and coming athletes, and he's training with like very very good current well established athletes who are all competing for national team spots. They're all competing for Olympic spots, and they're all competing for Olympic medals. And you can't like you can't discount that. You can't discount the the usefulness of a very good training partner you can't discount the motivational factors of having this team of lifters who are all trying to get better who are all pushing for those olympic spots um and like weightlifting is one of china's largest sports you know like the in terms of getting medals at the olympics weightlifting matters a lot to them there is less to describe on facilities but the weight of the quality facilities is astronomical i mean yeah we can we can describe in words what they are <clears throat> but when you like in reality they mean so much like it sounds so little when you just say them in the words but in what they actually mean to an athlete competing is astronomical you know it is a huge like even things as little as being a 30 second walk from the training hall you know that is having your own private room right next to the training hall and canteen is just it means so much day to day to the athletes and so much to performance and like the ease of a session or any piece of equipment you could ever need for training, you know, all of these things, while they sound very short when you say them out loud, they are just so important to an athlete competing. Yeah, I think the the other thing I'd say about that Chinese system is the inclusion of outsiders into it. So, like, that whole bubble seems to be very, very insular, yet when you look at the staff they have over, they have, like, S&C coaches from the UK, they have doctors and medical staff from all over the world they have biomechanists from everywhere you know it's it's not this kind of closed loop that nobody else gets into and that they don't 
absorb uh, information from anyone else. Like the Chinese system and when Chinese weightlifting was starting off, it was Soviets that came over and Russians that came over to kind of kickstart off their weightlifting system. So from the very, very start, China has been learning from all the other countries who are progressing with athletes. Uh, and I think that is like, that's something where other countries definitely fall down where they are too insular and they don't look to the outside and they don't kind of look to blend different techniques together. Like people think Chinese weightlifting is this kind of cult thing. They think like, oh, I'm going to do a course on Chinese weightlifting and I'll learn all the secrets. Like Chinese weightlifting is a mixture of everybody's weightlifting. They obviously have their own little quirks, but they just learn very well from everybody. And they obviously learn very well from themselves as well. Um, but I would say that is one of the key things with that support system is that their coaches seem to be very, very open. Their systems seem to be very, very open to change and adaptation. Uh, and it's not this closed loop. So the last thing then is is PEDS, right? Performance enhancing drugs or gear or juice or whatever you want to call it. When you're looking to a country that's had as many positive tests as China... And that's had as much kind of cloak and dagger stuff going on with anti anti doping. Uh, it would be remiss of us not to mention this, right? So I don't think Lou's been popped. I don't think he's like, I don't think there was ever anything that came out in the media about it. But you have to kind of understand that in a country like this, that has a system as well refined as this, it's obviously, and in a sport as, as dirty as weightlifting, this is obviously going to be a factor. Um, and when you look for their superstars, and not only for their superstar, but for their superstar who's also probably one of the oldest Olympians going for a spot at, at, in weightlifting, uh, doping and gear, and Griff's going to probably talk about the genetic potential to dispose of metabolites with the gear, but you have to take it into account that this is probably happening a fair bit as well. Yeah, like we don't want to... Um you know it's very easy people get offended by this and it's it's um you know there was an example right uh the, the boys at lou's ashun barbell they run the company for lou right and uh, i'm sure they're very nice and we're not um we're not trying to insult anyone if you've listened no. to any of our stuff you know we couldn't give a shit about doping uh we, like y- you're not a bad person if you dope them honestly we we are <laughs> we literally recorded a podcast about the morality of doping if you before you come at us if you're going to attack us listen to that first it's yeah. like an hour and a half so before you you just jump on us but like we you know, we we do not say things as ever they are, but we'll it, it would be kind of uh, out of tune with us if we are out of kind of consistency with us. We did mention that realistically, it's very very likely that Luz Ajun is doping and using, or has used, or is currently using, and will keep using, you know, performance enhancing drugs. Um, that's not to say that's not like you know, that's not the reason he's the greatest weightlifter, but it's a huge part of that reason. It's a huge part sure. of the reason. Just on that point, yeah. I'd also go to say. Everybody else who wins a medal in that weight class, we would probably assume is doping as well. Yeah, like it's it's like I I don't, but it, I it can't just, think of anybody uh, it, in that class. Yeah, but it's a huge part of why he is probably still able to lift the weights he's lifting at his age, and it's a huge part of the reason why he was able to lift those weights in the first place. Um, like the um, the history of weightlifting is not on his side. It's not in his favor. Like the odds are not on his side that he is clean, you know, and it's, you know, you can argue all days, you know, like you can say he never tested positive and that's fine. Um, it, it's, it's very likely I would, I would put a lot of money on it. I would put all the money I have mm-hmm. in the world if I could get a conclusive answer, but I would be very sure that Luz Arjun is, is doping, you know? And again, you know, there's an example there where Luz Arjun put up a, a vi- barbell, put up a video of him when he was younger and they talked about his process and then he found a new coach and he went from something like 140, 160 to like 160, 190 in like three months, you know? And very rightly, people in the comments were like, oh, steroids, you know, or whatever. And uh, they yeah. were like, no, 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 it was just good training. Um, You know, people are not stupid and we certainly yeah. don't think our listeners are stupid, but we just had to mention it. There was no way we could possibly leave out one of the biggest reasons why Lou is probably still so good at performing weightlifting and that is performance sensing drugs. And people might say this, and if Luz Arjun Barbell see this, and they'll say, no, he's not on drugs, and that's fine, we're not going to argue with anyone, we don't we don't care, uh, we don't care to argue at this point with anyone, it just is what it is. Uh, it's not unfortunate or fortunate, it's just a fact of reality, it's part of his facilities, um, we still like Luz Arjun. Yeah, what a great lifter. Great lifter, phenomenal lifter. 
Uh, and thanks for I, watching. The last point uh, as oh, yeah. a bonus point, right? Go on. And this is a counterpoint. The reason Lou is doing so well as a 36 year old and he's still able to lift and he's still able to be so competitive has fuck all to do with the fact that he squat jerks. And if you're a weightlifter who's a year or two years into training and you think the squat jerk might be the one for me, it's not. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like, uh, if any more videos you'd like to know about or if you need suggestions, you things that you'd like to see us talk about, just let us know. Uh, don't forget to check out SeekStrength.com for one-to-one -one coaching and weightlifting, our weightlifting programs, our rotating your squat program, Secret Pull, 10-week deadlift program, Secret Press, 8-week press program. The rotating your squat program is one of the best programs in the market. Uh, we've had like 45 kilos uh, PBs in 8 weeks. Uh, the average is somewhere in like 25 kilos out of... Um, we're in the... Close to the thousands of lifters now have ran it of all sorts, not just weightlifters, powerlifters, general gym goers. So um, check those out. If you like the video, thumbs up, comment, all that is very greatly appreciated. Thanks, guys. Thanks.